like to welcome everybody to this month's American Cannabis. I'm your host, Ellis Smith. Uh, I'd like to thank our um, sponsors, Cannabis Tech. And today our topic is extraction. And we're lucky to have James Lieberman from THC Safety here in the office. And excited to uh, share my experiences I've had with Jim, uh, taking one of his courses around extraction, and uh, have him explain to, uh, to, to our audience his experience working in the industry and uh, see you know, where he understands the, the pitfalls and how the industry is changing and ever evolving and what his expertise around extraction is. And so I'd like to welcome Jim. Thanks for coming in today. Alice, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, address your audience and speak about cannabis extraction. Well, Jim, let's, let's go ahead and dive in here. If you would, give me a, a little bit of background on your bio and kind of what, what your background is and how you got in the cannabis space. Uh, well, Ellis, uh, my background is fairly uh, torture here in getting into <laughs> cannabis. So I started off graduating from the University of Richmond with a degree in chemistry. And uh, I worked at the University of Wisconsin in a trace element nutrition laboratory. And then I uh, had an opportunity to, be, to come out to Colorado and enjoy skiing for a few years. And when I went back to a uh, career, uh, that career led me uh, in the field of regulation. In this particular time, it was water and sanitation. I was actually working for Bale Associates. And uh, when I got a chance, I actually went back to graduate school and uh, got an MBA in finance. I was going to create a portable water filter for backpackers, campers, and hikers after getting Giardia. I didn't know that about <laughs> you. That's, that's awesome. No kidding. <laughs> yes. And that ended up uh, taking me, I joined a company called uh, Nuclear Filter in Golden, Colorado, and uh, started working in Department of Energy laboratories, uh, specifically uh, in the areas of radioactive, hazardous waste, toxic material, et cetera, et cetera. And that led me into some interesting backgrounds. <clears throat> so <clears throat> bringing this up because in cannabis, uh, especially for cannabis extraction, uh, my opportunity to have worked onshore and offshore on oil platforms uh, really allowed me to see what it takes to be safe when handling flammable and explosive mixtures, um, air mixtures. Uh, it's really hard to conceptualize if you have never seen a refinery what it takes, again, to install the right equipment uh, to make a safe environment. But I had a very varied background uh, working in these Department of Energy facilities and other commercial facilities um, while I was working at Nuclear Filter Technology. And um, my last uh, position, I was uh, contracting myself out to Los Alamos Natural Laboratory. And, uh, uh, and enjoying work in New Mexico. But uh, I had uh, previously been asked by a, another co-professional, her name was Cynthia, if I would assist with a company that wanted to uh, establish the first uh, LPG, or liquefied petroleum gas extraction facility in Boulder, Colorado. And, uh, I said yes, and this was a. Uh, I thought this would be a fun thing to do on the side. <laughs> so um, I was helping this facility. Uh, first thing I was doing is coming up to speed on what they really wanted to do. The second thing I was doing is um, speaking to the city of Boulder. This was before the state of Colorado had regulations. This is while only Boulder had regulations. And I met a, a gentleman named Neil in the building department, very nice guy. And I said, Neil, what is your guidance? And he said, well, here's the five pages of guidance. So the five pages of guidance essentially said, comply with everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> OK. <laughs> so then I went back uh, and decided, now, I'm going to use my pharmaceutical. I didn't mention that, but I worked in pharmaceuticals for nine years also. So I used the pharmaceutical background to see how I could design a facility that would be safe and efficient for the extraction of cannabinoids using liquefied petroleum gas. In this case, it was butane. 
and uh, I presented an idea to the Boulder uh, building department, and they were happy about it. Presented the idea to the client. It, uh, they thought it was a uh, substantial sum to, to actually have the facility built. Um, knowing what I know from pharmaceuticals, it was actually re very recently costed. But, <laughs> uh, in those days and times, it, we were we were moving from kind of the shadows into the light, and so people didn't realize what the an actual industrial environment looked like. Anyway, we got the facility designed and built, and um, uh, I was given a, a great attaboy by the city. Essentially, they adopted <clears throat> the guidelines that I established for this facility. Essentially, they're, they're a standard for the industry in Boulder. So uh, my client was very happy after that since he was operating and everybody else was not <laughs> until they came up to the, the minimum requirements that we set. Okay. And so I guess this is the jumping off point of where you got your feet wet in the cannabis sector. You had been traditional in other uh, industries. And is this where THC safety comes into the picture now, where you did one of these projects, you, you got your feet wet, and then is this how you created THC safety? Yes, kind of. Um, again, I remember I was mentioning uh, Los Alamos. Well, I, I, after this initial job, I started getting other word-of-mouth work, and I was, again, doing this on the side. And I continued to do it on the side for a couple of years, and uh, then it got to be quite a bit of work. And uh, my son was just about to graduate from the University of Hawaii uh, in civil engineering. Oh, wow. And I asked Ben uh, if he would join me because uh, there are certain things that I'm really good at, i.e. Um, chemistry, toxicology, uh, ventilation, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, as far as, as doing social media these days and things like that, I'm fairly clueless. So uh, in, unless Ben was going to join me, I was going to continue my career at Los Alamos and then retire. I understood. Um, but he said uh, he was excited and said, uh, Dad, I'll join you and uh, we'll, we'll do this together. And uh, with that, I said, okay, we're going to really make this a particular you know, a business. So I left uh, Los Alamos in uh, 20... The, around the beginning of 2015, and devoted uh, my time exclusively, almost exclusively, uh, to cannabis facilities. And THC Safety has been helping facilities, helping design cannabis facilities, or plan, design, uh, build, and then what we call commission and optimize cannabis facilities since that time. Okay, and so this is uh, what you have started. This is how I actually met Jim. I signed up for one of his courses and uh, came in and learned all about extraction and a lot of the urban myths and urban rumors that I had been told of around a lot of these different extraction uh, processes and procedures um, were soon quickly realized that they were what they were, urban myths and legends. And so Jim really helped me get a lot more clarity behind a lot of the things that I had been told and so uh, he's been a great wealth of knowledge in taking that class, and he's actually helped ACC on projects past this. And so uh, if you could do a deep dive on TAC safety, which you've been doing since 2015 since you've come here, and you and your son Ben have really, you know, focused on the industry fully. And, um, you know, what are you guys up to today? And like, how did that, uh, you know, quickly expand to where it is today? Well, Ellis, um, I'll start by the courses, uh, and then I'll continue on. So thank you very much for the compliment. I actually teach two courses. One is cannabis concentrate production technology, and the other is cannabis facility design. That one is an American Institute of Architecture uh, accredited course. Awesome. So um, the CCPT course, uh, the one that you took, I realized um, that there was a dearth of knowledge on the, the chemical and physical requirements in addition to the regulatory requirements in addition to the practical requirements of establishing either an extraction, infusion, or laboratory facility. So um, I uh, did what I kind of do. I like, to, I like to educate people, and I like to 
have my clients understand what they're getting into so that they can plan well. So in developing a THC safety, one of the things that we did and which developed into this course is the first thing we do for clients normally in our planning stage is create a document called the safety envelope. That's our trademark document, the safety envelope for cannabis facilities. And what that is, essentially is the distillation of a lot of different requirements. Remember when the city of Boulder said comply with everything, I needed to find out what that is. So that's the International Fire Code, the International Building Code, International Mechanical Code, Plumbing Code, in addition to National Fire Protection Association's 3058 and additionals, uh, in addition to the National Electrical Code, and I could go on and on not to bore people. Uh, we've got uh, EPA regulations, we have OSHA regulations. So realizing that, uh, uh, and in my past I've been successful in taking all of these different regulatory requirements and tra translating them into English. <clears throat> the safety envelope document does it for a specific facility. It takes what do we need to do to meet all these different requirements for this specific facility that you're, the client's interested in. The course uh, grew out of that, and the course was more wide open, saying, okay, if you want, if you're thinking about establishing a facility, here's the type of regulations, uh, here's the type of uh, environment and regulations and the type of facility and equipment. So I take uh, the individual from the beginning of saying, if you're curious about this, now let's take a look at what type of equipment, what type of products, what type of processes, methods. Let's see the hurdles of the building department, uh, employing uh, uh, industrial hygienists such as myself, uh, an architect, engineer, and then having a general contractor to actually build your facility, having the facility meet regulations and be inspected, certified, and uh, in operating. So, uh, it's been very rewarding because um, I have a, a wide spectrum uh, of attendees. They come from all different walks of life. And what I like to do is allow uh, the attendees to ask questions. In fact, I encourage them to bring their question so we can answer it. I found that, number one, it really contributes to the discussion. But number two, uh, a lot of times, other people will have the similar question. So it, uh, it's rewarding to me, too. It keeps me on my toes. Yes, I have to yes. answer these new questions. And obviously, this is an industry that is exploding. We've got <clears throat> new processes coming online. We have new equipment. So uh, what I knew yesterday doesn't necessarily mean uh, what is valid for today. So I have to keep uh, keep on the cutting edge, and the, the, believe me, the students will ask questions that do that, and many times I have to say, um, I'm not familiar with that, let me, let me get up to speed. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, I, uh, for a client uh, that wanted to do, uh, this is again a little tangential, but a client that wanted to do uh, extraction using ethanol, uh, I actually went and visited the uh, company that produced the ethanol extraction equipment, so I could be physically present, see what the equipment looked like, speak to the designer, et cetera, et cetera, so that we could actually come up with really good engineering and administrative controls to support the operation. So anyway, um, uh, what that's kind of what THC safety has been doing. So what we've evolved in is um, being able to help people at the planning stage. So if they're thinking about making, uh, creating a cannabis extraction facility, uh, we can walk them through uh, the steps. And then if they're interested in really getting down to brass tacks, uh, then we contract with them. Uh, we, the contract can start off and just be the safety envelope. But more, more than likely, when we engage a client, we build a safety envelope for them. We also create the, the, the actual layout for their extraction, 
infusion, laboratory, and post-processing portion of their building. Uh, we specify in great detail uh, equipment that they need. Uh, this is the larger and smaller equipment that they're going to need in their facility. So they can see uh, the different types. And of course, the client has final choice, but at least now they have some examples of what will be required. Um, and then with the layout, they can see a space filling and a 3D model of, oh, this is what uh, my facility would look like. And uh, once we go back and forth and back and forth with the client, and they say, wow, this is, this is what we want, uh, then we'll <clears throat> either work with our architect or the client's architect and take the ideas and turn them into an architectural drawing. Uh, and at that point, we can engage the engineers. That would be the uh, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and structural engineers that are necessary to turn the ideas into, uh, you know, uh, into a structure. But we need to get a packet together. The packet is what you, the client will take to the planning department to have their building and facility approved. Many times it's in conjunction with the state requirement, but most of the time it's, it's the local municipality whose building regulations we're trying to meet. So anyway, we help the client <clears throat> and get through the municipality. Many times we have a, what I call, I call a dog and pony show, meaning <laughs> we actually meet with the municipality, the building officials, um, and review uh, the hazards of the operation, our engineering and administrative controls, mm -hmm. and our recommendations. So um, uh, that gets them started. And now <clears throat> they'll be in the construction stage. In the construction stage, we would assist the general contractor and his subcontractors when they have questions. Now, I've never, ever seen a facility that's been built where there isn't significant questions that come up. Mm -hmm. Because this is a new industry, and these contractors are not familiar with the equipment. And uh, even contractors that have built laboratories uh, still have uh, questions. Anyway, we help them through that, and then the municipality or state has questions, and we help the client answer those. Now they've gotten through the construction, and then we're at the commissioning stage, which is really exciting for me. The commissioning stage is the most difficult and strenuous stage uh, for, for uh, a professional because I have to go and check out all their equipment, and you'd be amazed what kind of silly mistakes are made. For instance, uh, they may have a vacuum line uh, with a check valve that's reversed instead of having it. So now it's theoretically pressurized, and, and uh, the check valve was in a pressure position instead of a vacuum position. Uh, they may have uh, three-phase power. They may have phases reversed. So now equipment is not operating correctly because the electric, electrical supply is not correct. We have to make sure that the gas detection equipment has been installed properly, has been calibrated. The <clears throat> same thing with the ventilation uh, equipment. So if they have, a, let's say, for instance, a fume hood, we'll test the face velocity of the fume hood and look at what's called the test and balance, the tab sheets, to make sure that the uh, HVAC contractor did do what they're supposed to do. Anyway, without belaboring the point, um, the uh, uh, commissioning facility takes someone that really knows what they're doing to find out uh, if everything's been put together right and if we do our job right, the facility will be ready to go and, and start processing. And once the, uh, they're actually processing, uh, we will hopefully have assisted them in getting their their uh, in, their administrative controls, their SOPs together, their standard operating procedures, and hopefully we'll be called in later to help them optimize some particular process that they want to um, to make the best in the industry. So that's the synopsis of what THC Safety does. Well, it was, uh, as I mentioned before, it was a wealth of knowledge for me to attend your course, and <clears throat> it was very eye-opening to see 
the content and material shared to the videos and really truly seeing how quickly gas can move across the floor and really uh, cause some, 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 some serious damage. And so um, it, that, was, that, that component was eye-opening to me. You know, you're, you're referring to your time working on oil rigs and gas rigs and maintaining fumes and these types of things. And so this is what, what was very uh, interesting to me to learn in your course on how dangerous this truly is. And uh, you can definitely kill yourself if you're not careful and designed properly. And yeah. Yes, well, let's, um, let's talk about that a little bit because this is what I like to, to educate people in the course. And uh, I had an opportunity to work at uh, multiple Department of Energy facilities, one in which actually assembled and disassembled nuclear weapons. And obviously, you don't want mistakes to be made. Human, and humans make mistakes. So what uh, the goal of that facility was, and uh, participated in that is doing what we call the fence in depth, meaning you think through the type of errors that the person can make, and then you think what engineering control can I put in place that even if they make a boo boo will not be catastrophic. And the goal is to give the uh, imp the person three strikes, meaning the first time they make a mistake, there's not an incident. The second time they make a mistake, it's still not an incident. The third time they make a mistake, it could be a very catastrophic incident. So you can't engineer out uh, everything, <laughs> but you can, uh, you can engineer in a lot of safety. So for our facilities, for instance, let's take a, uh, the cannabis extraction room that THC has designed. We actually have designed a uh, safe facility for LPG uh, liquefied petroleum gas extraction. We, uh, we have it in a, in, in a kit form, and we have it uh, in a planning form, so it could be either built on site or it can be purchased as a kit and assembled. And with that site, we have, um, we have uh, patent pending uh, ventilation. So if, for, by chance, the operator makes a mistake and releases a significant amount of butane or liquefied petroleum gas into the atmosphere, the room's ventilation uh, actually pushes and pulls it or sucks it away so that relatively quickly uh, that hazard of explosivity, because uh, it only takes 2% butane in air to make an explosive atmosphere, the, uh, that, that concentration is reduced in a matter of minutes to below what we call 25% of the lower explosive limit. In addition to that, we've engineered this room so there's no ignition sources, meaning uh, there's no way that well, someone can create a spark, either static or by uh, any electrical equipment. All the electrical equipment in the room is National Electrical Code, Class 1, Division 1, Group D, explosion-proof equipment. And we minimize that electrics because that, that type of equipment is very expensive. So we try to use things, um, use air power, pneumatically operated, and then we use, uh, uh, if something needs to be electrically powered, we can have it operated in an adjacent room, we call that the ante room. And then, for instance, a heater or chiller, uh, we can bring the chilled water line in or the heated water line in to help operate the equipment. But we make, a, a, again, exceptionally safe environment uh, for the operation of that type of uh, facility. So as we kind of talk about the engineering and the basic infrastructure for the operation side here, um, what kind of equipment goes into these facilities for, you know, LPG extraction? Uh, you know, what kind of uh, equipment are you putting in there and how do these processes work based around this schematic design that you've come up with to be safe? Well, Alice, um, the first thing we, we like to do is, again, is do the facility uh, that the equipment is going to exist in. So and for our cannabis extraction room, we have an anti-room. Um, part of the anti-room is classified as class one, division two. Part of the anti-room is not classified, so that's your entry and exit point. And then you uh, go, move into the actual extraction room, which is the 
NEC Class 1 Division 1 room, and that's where you'll have your extraction equipment. Uh, in that particular room, uh, you'll have dedicated ventilation. In addition to the dedicated ventilation, you'll have a dedicated fixed uh, monitor for flammable vapors or gases uh, <clears throat> that's operating continuously. That detector will be uh, connected uh, to an alarm, uh, either both an auditory alarm and a visual alarm. So if by chance, uh, there is a gas release and it exceeds 25% of the lower explosive limit, the operator will be informed by the alarm and then instructed to follow the SOP, which essentially means secure the equipment, turn off everything, leave the room, and let the ventilation do what it's designed to do, and that is reduce the, uh, the concentration of airborne explosive gas. Um, then we turn around and talk about the actual extraction equipment. In this case, we are talking about LPG or liquefied petroleum gas. And the reason I use the, the term LPG instead of the slang butane is because people can use multiple gases. They can use butane, what you call N-butane. They can use isobutane. They can also use propane. They can also use mixtures of gases. And that, there's actually additional ones that they can use, but that's enough for this con uh, conversation. So what we designed, and they, they can also do large-scale solvent, i.e. Uh, heptane or ethanol uh, type of extraction. This room is su suitable for multiple uh, types of operations that involve the potential release of uh, flammable or explosive gases or vapors. So um, we help the, the uh, client look at different equipment that's on the market. Um, first thing we do is ask the client, what's their throughput? Meaning, for us, how many pounds per day that they intend to process? And that will help us direct them to different manufacturers' equipment. Uh, we particularly like to work with a company in Denver called ETS. Uh, Matt Ellis, I think, makes some uh, excellent equipment, and it's extraction tech. Um, they have a device uh, extractor called an NEP, uh, which is a larger uh, piece of equipment. They also have a smaller one, which is their 1300 model. So, um, again, the, uh, the throughput that the client is looking for uh, helps us direct them towards the size of the extraction equipment that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And again, um, we don't uh, dictate to, to them. We try to uh, present them with alternatives and educate them. The client makes their own final decisions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then so outside of that specific engineered room that's going to handle the extraction side, what other equipment goes inside that now from the post-processing side? Oh, well, let me mention one other thing, fire suppression. I forgot to mention that uh, this room, of course, will either have a dedicated dry chemical fire suppression system or, better yet, a wet sprinkler system. Um, and, of course, they'll have it within 75 feet of the room and hopefully closer, will have at least a 10-pound fire extinguisher for use. Okay. Uh, but let's move on to, uh, to the post-processing. That's a, a very interesting and exciting area for me. So, uh, when I was in drug discovery in that pharmaceutical environment, I helped design analytical laboratories in what's called synthetic organic chemistry laboratories, and then a uh, scale-up. So synthetic organic is when you're making small quantities of a, what we call potent compound, or uh, it would be something that's very biologically active, so you wouldn't want humans exposed to it. And then the scale-up is when you need to make m larger quantities to do either trials in animals or trials in humans. Um, so I had a lot of really good uh, experience designing laboratories from that experience. Um, it, was, was, it was actually priceless, and I, would, but I never knew I would apply it in a different environment, <laughs> completely different than pharmaceutics. But uh, it actually transfers to the cannabis world quite well. I'm sure. 
So in the cannabis world, um, we want to, um, and I'm going to take the most common, again, every single facility is different because we, we try to design that for the quantity that the, the client wants to process, the type of products that they want to make. So the types of products that you want to make drives the type of operations and equipment you're going to need. But let's take the most typical. So uh, let, uh, many times we want to be able to do a process called winterization. Uh, winterization is where you mix the cannabis extract, the raw extract, with uh, ethanol and solubilize it. Once it's solubilized, you winterize this material, meaning you chill it probably minus 20 to minus 35 C uh, for a period of time, depending on how good your freezer is, anywhere between 8 and 24 hours. And then uh, you filter the, uh, the resulting material uh, to remove what we call waxes. And if you've done it right, these waxes will precipitate. There'll be a white uh, uh, precipitant at the bottom of the vessel that you're chilled. And you have to make sure that all the filtration devices are also chilled, otherwise you're going to melt your, uh, your precipitant. Anyway, you, you filter it, and this removes the waxes. Um, these waxes are more like a petroleum jelly-based material. They're, very, they're gelatinous. They're not like hard candle wax or anything. Now, a lot of times the reason people would want to remove these waxes is that they make, it makes for a more, uh, if you, for a vape, it makes for a much smoother vape. The uh, waxes are harsh. Some people like to, to, uh, to inhale the, uh, the more, I call it the waxy material. The waxes, but, the butters, those types of products. Exactly. They have more of the wax in them. But if, um, if you're making a vape cartridge, many times uh, the manufacturer would like to remove those waxes and make the, uh, the vape smoke a lot uh, smoother. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's one process. So uh, that process, we need to stabilize, we need to mix, we need a, a safe environment to do that. Then we need a process to concentrate. So I'm going to use a typical, and again, there's so many ways to skin the cat, that, sure. that, uh, and especially in different volumes and sizes. But let's say we've got um, a fume hood. Let's say we have a standard eight foot wide fume hood. We can do all our solvent mixing in, inside that fume hood, uh, make it safe to protect the, the, the actual operation and the uh, the operator. Uh, once we've made that mix, we can use um, a chest freezer that's designed uh, uh, to a laboratory standard, flammable liquids, and we chill our mixture. Uh, then we can filter it. Uh, we have our filtration equipment already chilled. We can put that in our hood or on the bench. In fact, since it's fairly cold, the number, the amount of vapor that comes off of very cold ethanol is limited. Mm. Once we filter, uh, we would use, uh, we would collect the filtrate and take and uh, probably put it in a rotary evaporator. Okay. If we have a nice rotary evaporator, we can concentrate, uh, meaning we remove the ethanol that we added. Uh, we re actually recover it as a distilled, clean ethanol to reuse. Mm -hmm. And then we um, have our oil, our, our cleaned oil. Now, we need to take that oil and uh, put it in uh, to an appropriate container, probably a Pyrex dish, and place it into uh, a vacuum oven in order to get the last residual uh, of the ethanol out of the oil. Um, there are standards that most states have uh, stipulated for the residual solvent content in extracts. And typically, the way you reach these standards is to place your clean extract into a vacuum oven to get let rid of the last bit of either liquefied petroleum gas or ethanol or other solvent. And then now you've got uh, your, your cleaned material, and now you can put that in a vape cartridge. Um, you can also take our extract and dilute it and make what we call a tincture or a standard solution uh, to be put into edibles. 
we could also uh, do much, much more fancy chemistry and actually take that and spray dry it and make it into a solid for a tablet form. Or you could put it in a gel cap, dilute it in, uh, to a standard strength and put it in a gel cap. You could also uh, mix it with a appropriate emollients and make it uh, and, and, and penetrate a patch. The patch would be uh, essentially uh, uh, stuck onto a, a part of the body that's affected and then uh, the cannabinoids would be released over time to give relief. That'd be an excellent medical product. Um, there's the subcutaneous tinctures, I mean the, the oils to put on your tongue. Uh, there's lotions that can be formulated. There's a world of different products that can be made from these cannabinoids. That's exactly why I say in order to design the facility, we really need to know what the client end products or you know, what the client wants as the end product. Through this step that you were, you were just kind of walking me through here, <clears throat> and you're saying we can make these final products with it, is there, is there an activation process? Is that in oil coming out of that, um, out of that oven and coming out of the evaporator? Is it, is, it, uh, is it active or do you still need to heat it up? Or where, as you start to make it and spray it onto these other products, how would that happen? Well, let's talk about that. It's very interesting. And that brings up the introduction to our, uh, uh, our continuing discussion of different methods of extraction. When you do uh, an LPG extraction, um, you do it uh, under cold conditions. Mm -hmm. So the actual cannabinoids that are removed from the plant matter are in the acid form. Mm -hmm. So we have THCA or CBDA or other cannabinoids in the acid form. In the acid form, they're not psychotropic, meaning they're not active. Uh, in, uh, they don't pass the blood-brain barrier to give the person the buzz. Uh, that they would expect from a THC containing material. <clears throat> now, the material could be activated before extraction, meaning it could be the plant matter could be heated to approximately 240 degrees uh, before uh, extraction, but that's be very unusual with LPG. With uh, CO2 extraction, there's some reasons to do that. Uh, there's mixed reviews because when you heat something, you're going to sacrifice your terpenes unless you can capture them. So and that's a whole that's a whole nother webinar discussion sure, on, sure. on uh, how to uh, process your cannabinoid material so that you keep your your terpenes. And uh, of course live resin is a very is growing and is going to be a very popular uh, product, and of course that would be from an LPG extraction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so what we want to be able to do is uh, take our material and process it in a way uh, in which we can get it to the form which we need to post-process. And again, if we're selecting LPG, then we're going to be looking at a shatter or a, or a butter, or a, I call it peanut butter, or mm -hmm. wax, or mm -hmm. there's a lot of different slang terminologies. You can also make a vape out of it, but it's secondary processing would be definitely winterization because LPG uh, removes quite a bit of wax from the material. Uh, we could uh, continue on with the extract after we've winterized it and actually distill it. I think people have heard about clear, and or there's other slang terms for it. But essentially, when you do your initial extract, be it whatever method, uh, LPG, CO2, ethanol, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you extract the cannabinoids. But in addition, you're extracting sugars and starches and water and waxes and other plant materials. So. The first pass, you're not getting 100% cannabinoids. That would be uh, much too much to ask for. <laughs> but um, you are getting somewhere between 40 and 60 or 70% cannabinoids, depending on the starting material, of course. If you start with a low-grade uh, 
plant material, then you're going to get a lower grade extract, of course. But let's say that we, <clears throat> we've conducted our extraction and we've done our winterization. If we choose, we can actually use a device, uh, a, a white film or some other device for distillation. Distillate is pretty nifty in that you can separate uh, the byproduct that we were speaking of and get your concentrate to a 90 or 95 percent cannabinoid content. So a very pure material. Um, and this can be uh, formulated into products or vape cartridges or other things. Um, it's, uh, and it can actually even be flavored with uh, the original terpenes or additionals. Okay. So uh, it's, it's quite an art to make a distillate in, uh, in its many, many different forms. Um, I like that. That's where, the, that's where you hear this term. Um, the extraction artist, you know, where yes. it, this, this is where that is relevant. It makes complete sense. When there's different ways to, to skin a cat to get this complete, everyone has their nuances of a way they kind of put out a final product. And so, absolutely. And so, I'm going to plug one of my, uh, my clients for a second because I think that they do such a good job of <clears throat> making an extract and infusing it into a product. So, um, it's Love's Oven. Okay. So Walter has a wonderful operation. Um, he does a lipid extraction, and I won't go into the details because that's his proprietary information, but he'll make his extract and infuse it into cookies and candies and chocolates and all, many varieties of, uh, of edibles, and he does a wonderful job of making a very, very high-end product. Um, you can see his operation. You could literally eat off the floor. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, that's another thing to say. I love it. Um, extraction <clears throat> and then post-processing, is. Are, I look at them very differently. I look at extraction more like a laboratory operation. Some of the post-processing is addition uh, like a laboratory operation, but infusion, <clears throat> excuse me, infusion is more like a commercial kitchen, mm -hmm. at least infusion for edibles. Mm -hmm. So, um, when I'm working with clients, I try to make that distinction clear and say, well, if you want to take your extract and infuse it into an edible, we really need a different facility, a different, different room uh, designed and uh, set up much differently, more like a commercial kitchen, sure. following the National Sanitation Foundation guidelines and the municipal guidelines and the state. There's quite a few guidelines for, obviously, commercial kitchens uh, because of health regulations that have evolved over the years. And it, sometimes you, you, you really need to ask the municipality because some municipalities will actually define the extract as a, as a food product and some people, some municipalities don't. But all municipalities, once it, it's infused into something that's going to be eaten by a human, uh, we'll consider that a food product, and you have to handle it and package it, et cetera, et cetera like a food product. Okay. Um, <clears throat> tell me the advantages and disadvantages of a, a pre-engineered LPT extraction room, and just, you know, why that's, what, what are the advantages? Well, the advantages are speed. So, for instance, if, a, if someone buys our cannabis extraction room as a kit, it's a 10-week delivery time. Uh, they don't have to build anything. They don't have to have the, uh, the building department approve, quote, unquote, construction. It comes in as a kit. It's assembled and then uh, commissioned after it's assembled. There is contractors that do need to participate, though, m meaning this. The kit would still need to be connected to the gas, uh, natural gas of the building, the electrical system in the building. They would still have to have... Um, uh, piping or vent ducting for the makeup air and the exhaust air, but all the, the components would be there. So it's not like there's no installation involved. There is definitely installation involved by electrical contractors and HVAC contractors. But for the most part, it greatly cuts down on the time. Most, it, someone that's starting from scratch should plan on a six month to a, probably a 10 month time 
in order to get an extraction room designed, built, and operating. So they shouldn't think it's going to be an overnight affair. Um, I had many people uh, that are disappointed. They're like, well, we want to do this in a very expedited fashion, uh, one or two months. And I'm saying, to build, you can't do it in that period of time. So if you want to do something really expedited, a pre-engineered room with all the uh, design considerations taking, already taking place, et cetera, et cetera, and just the assembly would speed operation. Now, um, if you're going to uh, build a facility, uh, then especially if you're going to build a facility with multiple extraction rooms, it may be less expensive to actually build on site if you're going to do multiple rooms. It's almost always less expensive if you're only going to put one or two extraction rooms okay. because <clears throat> the engineering required that we've already done, engineering required <clears throat> to be recapitulated, I mean, I'm, again, we can't just, we can give the designs, but you still have to have an engineer review that, approve it, and, and get it through the building department, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, th that, again, can save time and money depending on how many uh, different rooms you would be building out. Okay, so I, I took your course and I went in there with a, a view from the urban myth that I've been told about butane extraction, LPG technology, and um, just how it's bad and it's not healthy. And I quickly learned after going through your course that th these were urban urban myths, and you really help you know bring a lot of clarity behind this this so-called dirty technology, which I, I tend to disagree with now after, you know, being educated and learning truly what it's all about. And so just, what, you know, compare and contrast CO2 extraction versus LPG extraction and, um, you know, why it is it healthy and safe and it, it's not that bad? Well, let's, let's do that. Um, but before we jump into the comparison of CO2 and uh, LPG, I, I want to do this. I want to um, let people know that uh, neither of these are quote-unquote toxic materials, which is great. Uh, obviously, uh, LPG is extremely flammable, whereas CO2 is not. But in the, how these, some of these urban legends got formed, I think the basis of this is important. When people were doing open blasting, they were using uh, butane gas that has what we call uh, fusel oils in them. These fusel oils are contaminants, mm -hmm. and they're fairly nasty, meaning uh, taste and odor fashion nasty. Now, uh, for filling your lighter, your butane lighter, the fuel was perfectly adequate. It was, it was adequate to be burned. It wasn't uh, adequate to be used as a solvent for processing cannabis. So, um, that's, I believe, how LPG originally got the, the bad name. And when we commission an LPG system, um, I tell clients that they need to run the system without any plant material a number of cycles, and they need to inspect the, um, the reservoir where you uh, collect your extract to see if there's any uh, residue. In a new system, there almost always is a residue of these different cutting oils, fuse oils, et cetera, et cetera, from the machining of the, uh, of the stainless steel, mm. from the inside of the tubing, especially if the tubing is not Teflon lined. If it's an in-butyl rubber hose, then you are going to extract the, uh, what we call plasticizers, and that's going to come out, and those plasticizers essentially are going to smell like the inside of an inner tube you know, a mm -hmm. bike or a yep. car uh, tire inner tube. So you need to run your systems multiple times with, with your gas to flush and clean them out. Once you've got your system clean, then you should start doing uh, using it uh, for extraction. Okay. But anyway, that was one of the bases. So let's go through um, some of the comparisons and contraction. I think we have a table here so that the, the listener can follow. Again, um, starting off with flammability, obviously CO2 or carbon dioxide is not flammable, and uh, LPG is. Uh, and that, of course, directly impacts the type of facility. 
if you're going to make a CO2 facility, uh, it does not have to have as much as uh, much in-depth engineering controls as an LPG facility has. Obviously, we're not going to create a potentially explosive atmosphere. Both of these are non-toxic. They're what we call simple asphyxiants. They displace oxygen. Um, and uh, that you look at the what's called the permissible exposure limit for CO2, it's 5,000 parts per million. And for LPG, it's about 1,000. But these are relatively, these numbers represent a relatively non-toxic material. Uh, and they are simply asphyxiants, meaning they will displace the oxygen. Or, obviously, uh, LPG will also create an explosive atmosphere. Uh, as far as the pressure, uh, for CO2, we need a minimum of 900 PSI. And most of the time, the, the bottom line, uh, you never operate less than approximately 1,200 PSI. And many machines operate up to 5,000 PSI. So we have equipment that has high pressure. And high pressure engenders other uh, hazards, obviously, uh, can make things, uh, if they break, they're like projectiles, yes. like, like a, a bullet firing. Yes. Um, LPG usually operates from about 25 to 125 PSI, so it's much less pressure or lower pressure. Um, the LPG, excuse me, the CO2 room has to be ventilated, but the ventilation requirements are fairly minimal. Uh, we need to have <clears throat> a number of air changes per hour to make sure that if, <clears throat> if there is a release of CO2, it, it is ventilated and removed. But uh, for, for an LPG, we have to have much, much higher ventilation rates. And if we need to meet the International Mechanical Code 510 requirements, as we do in Denver, uh, then, the, the, uh, then the rates are in uh, almost 100 air changes per hour. So we're looking at very high air exchange rates to make a safe environment. So and now, if we take a look at the electrical requirements, uh, for a CO2 room, there is no uh, necessary National Electric Code requirements. You can use uh, standard electrical appliances, whereas in an LPG room, they have to meet the C1, D1 requirement. Um, here's the, one of the major differences. Uh, I don't see the number on the LPG side, but it should be one. So <clears throat> in order to uh, get a good extract using a, a um, machine operating with CO2, you have to make multiple passes through the plant matter. Uh, the solubilizing power of CO2 is significantly less than for uh, an LPG. An LPG is a one-pass system, meaning you pass the liquid through the plant matter once, and it's done. So because you need to pass the, the liquefied uh, carbon dioxide through the plant matter multiple times in order to get your uh, extract, uh, it's a slower process. So it can be significantly slower. And I know there's a lot of smoke and mirrors out there. And there's different equipment. Uh, those equipment that use liquid, that start off with a liquid uh, carbon dioxide, can be much faster than those start off with a gaseous carbon dioxide. But in my experience, <clears throat> the, it's about six-fold, meaning the LPG for the same plant matter mass, let's say we're talking about a kilo, uh, will be six times faster than, uh, than CO2. Uh, again, we're only talking about one parameter, but that's, that parameter is throughput. Um, equipment cost, usually the CO2 equipment cost is relatively high, whereas the LPG is moderate. Whereas the room cost is much lower for CO2, but the room cost for LPG is significantly higher. Um, we do need to winterize almost all of our CO2 extracts. There's some people that are able to tune their supercritical extraction, uh, but that's a very, very small minority that are able to tune it so they don't need winterization. And <clears throat> Depending on the product that we want to make, if we're going to make a shatter from LPG, that is the product. It doesn't have to be winterized. Or if we're making a wax, it doesn't have to be winterized. But for further processing, yes, it would be. <clears throat> we do need to monitor the atmosphere 
For CO2, it would be a carbon dioxide monitor operating continuously. And for LPG, it would be a flammability monitor operating continuously. And then um, the throughput, and when I translate throughput, I mean dollars per pound per day, meaning the dollars invested uh, in the amount of material that you could process, essentially your speed. Mm -hmm. it's, up, it's higher for CO2, and again, uh, uh, and it's lower for LPG, but again, you have to look at the, the totality of these different comparisons to make a decision on what product that your facility wants to make and how you want to make it. So I never tell the client that you can only do this, you can only do that. I, what I try to do is educate them on the relative advantages and disadvantages of different operations and methods so that they can make an intelligent decision. Out of these two methodologies, from a, uh, just a standard um, production capacity, which gets a better yield? Well, or a higher yield, I don't say better, it's a higher so yield. If I would say that uh, LPG has, a, has one leg up on uh, CO2 in that the solubilizing power of uh, the solvent is high. So let's say you start off, let's, let's take a hypothetical. Let's say you start off with a very high 25% uh, uh, cannabinoid content in your, in your plant matter. Well, <clears throat> with a one pass, you're probably going to get out approximately 70 or 80 percent with your LPG, maybe even a little bit higher depending wow. on your soak time. Mm -hmm. um, with your CO2, <clears throat> it may be a challenge to get that high a percent recovery. You may need to do two passes, meaning actually a harvest and then a re-extraction, mm -hmm. which is that's time consuming. Yeah. So <clears throat> from a strict uh, material processing throughput pers uh, perspective, uh, usually the liquefied petroleum gas has an advantage. Okay. Real quick, I have a question here before we wrap this up. We have a few minutes left, but, you know, you obviously are based in Colorado. What other markets are you able to work in? Just so some of our view viewers here may be in other parts of the country or the, or the world, and just are you able to help and assist in outside of this market? Well, THC safety has helped in almost every state in the country now that it that has either medical or recreational. Perfect. We've also assisted clients in Puerto Rico. We've also consulted with people in Europe. So we're we're essentially national now. There's there's no geographic boundary that we have. In fact, uh, lately, a significant number of clients have been based out of California. Okay. Uh, we've had a wonderful time assisting municipalities with the regulations and assisting clients with their facility design and construction and safety. It's been, it's been really uh, a fun ride, I have to say that. <clears throat> and I've seen some parts of California, like the Salinas Valley, that I've never seen before, which are be you know, beautiful. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll help. Uh, uh, obviously, consultants have to go where the work is, and we need to go where the client's based and help them out. With that said, usually a large percentage of the work that we do it's still done in our office, and then uh, we work electronically, either phone, email, stuff like that. And of course, we do uh, take physical trips out to the clients to see what their facilities like and help them. But uh, uh, distance is not a barrier. I love it. All right, one last plug here for you. Please let our audience know where some of your next courses and, and, and classes will be presented in Colorado or across the U.S. or wherever else, just so they know how they can get in touch with you. If, um, if a person is interested, they go to our website, which is thc-safety.com, uh, bring up our website, and go to the training tab. Uh, under that training tab, they'll see the two courses that we offer, the Cannabis Concentrate Production course, which is more geared to people that want to um, establish a, a facility, excuse me, establish a facility. And then the, um, the other one is the Cannabis Facility Design course. That's really for architects and engineers. Uh, we start at a very technical level in that course, so that's not a good overview or survey course. It's a good course that if you're professional and you're going to be building these facilities. Awesome. Well, Jim, it's great to have you in today. Uh, wealth of knowledge. I 
have a lot of notes, a lot of things I learned today. I swear every time I get together with you, I just pick up more and more information. I hope our audience uh, was able to learn some more as well. Uh, I got one quick question here. It says, what is the average cost for a thousand square foot? And this may be just be a hypothetical question that may be too hard to answer, but what's the average cost for a thousand square foot facility? Well, the cost, I'm going to break it down in a couple different ways. <clears throat> the cost for the, uh, the, 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 sea, the cannabis extraction room or this, that would be about 300 square foot. It's going to be in the neighborhood of 130,000 or so. For post-processing, you can count on uh, anywhere from $150, $250 per square foot finished. That's with equipment, you know, a, a facility that's, that's going to be able to operate. Most of the time, the sizes of the extraction rooms are fairly small. <clears throat> the individual extraction rooms will probably be in the neighborhood of 200 to 300 square foot. Whereas the post-processing facility will be in the neighborhood of somewhere between oh, 1,500 and uh, 5,000, depending on if it's a really large facility, 5,000 square feet. So those, uh, I know those are swags, rough numbers, but that's uh, some numbers for the audience to use to, to try to get a handle on costs. Perfect. On that 100 and, or on that 300 square feet that he mentioned for $130,000. That, that equates to about $433 a square foot to just give you guys a rough idea on what that looks like per square foot. But uh, once again, I want to thank you, Jim, for coming in today. I uh, hope our audience got some great information out of this, and I appreciate everyone tuning in uh, to the American Cannabis. Uh, everyone have a great rest of your afternoon, and we look forward to hearing from you next month. Everyone take care. Have a great day. Thanks, Jim. And thank you, Alice. It's been a pleasure.